Today, I will be speaking with a professional who offers his expertise on the challenges and benefits faced by both leadership and personnel. I'd like to introduce a CEO, coach, mentor, psychologist, well-being subject, matter expert, and a number one best-selling author of the book, Transforming Your, Li Your Life. And it's volume three. I'd like to introduce Peter Abrahamson. Peter, would you start by just telling us uh, about your background and, and uh, why you're so passionate about employee and employer relations? Yeah, sure. Um, my, my background is, is, is weird and wonderful. Um, I started as a, as a translator and interpreter back in Denmark and moved to the UK 30 years ago this year, actually. So I, I have a 40 year plus career having been an employee across different sections from planting letters in the field, cleaning hospitals, being an office junior, all the way up to being the boss of my own company or a chief um, operating officer in, in another company. So I've been the most junior, the most senior, but no matter what I've done in my career, be it as a consultant, supply chain consultant or translator, project manager, I've always been more interested in the people in the organization than the actual job I was there to do. Don't tell anybody. Uh, it's too late anyway. Um, so and I've now got to the point where I want to do what I believe in and, and what I'm passionate about, which is the well-being of people in the business. And by that, I mean everyone from top to bottom and all the layers in between. It's not just about employee well-being. It's about people well-being because chief execs are people too. And when they thrive, typically the rest of the business thrives. So that is, uh, some people think I, I have a, a very sort of left, left field, um, to use a British cricket term, um, background because I'm not an MBA, I haven't got an accountancy background, but I am a human being, I'm a psychologist, I'm a coach, I know about people, they interest me, and their well-being interest me as well. So I've actually taken business to psychology, not psychology to business. So I was in business long before I became a psychologist and I just, business drove me, inspired me if you like, <laughs> to, to doing my psychology qualification and I've just enjoyed it ever since. So in my previous life as a, as a supply chain consultant, we more and more saw our clients wanting us to find ways in which they could get rid of people to save money. And that goes against everything I believe in. Obviously, you, you need to have the right amount of people, not too many, not too few, but you can't just slash and burn your way through and, and hope that those left behind will, will carry the weight afterwards. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm working with the few to help the many. So that's wonderful. I you know, wanted to ask you about, if you could just, uh... At this moment, visualize challenges on one side and business owners on the other side. And, and with the commonality right in the center, uh, you can relate to both sides, right? If you look at, at the Venn diagram, we probably need to start with one circle and another circle. And, and they are far apart. We have employees, what they want. We have employers, what they want. So we know what divides us, but we don't know what unites us. And that's where the, the, the diagram comes together. So we're talking about the great resignation and the big quit. But before that happens, we have to look at the great discontent, because it's a discontent mostly that make people want to quit. But then when they quit and, and resign, then we have the great migration. So people are going somewhere. But where are they going? Why are they going? And until we know these questions, we, we can't just think, oh, this is a stampede away from something. Well, they're going to be going somewhere. So people are typically changing their crummy jobs for a better job or a low paid job for a better paid job or for personal development or professional development. It doesn't have to be all bad news. And, you know, this has been going on forever and a day. I've, I've changed jobs a number of times in my career. And I've gone from bad to better, and I've got from, gone from bad to even bloody worse. <laughs> Absolutely, from the, from the fire into the frying pan. And I got sacked after six months. Um, so it has always been going on. I just think the, the, the pandemic has enforced the message that people are now considering what's important in my life. And work is such a big part of one's life that 
the demands, the requirements on something other than the salary, which of course has to be there. Let's just take that for granted. And, and one that you can live on as, as well. They want more. They want to be treated like people. They, they want to feel involved and valued. And this is where employer, employee will have to start to come together. We know what separates us, but what do we know what's, what's sort of uniting us? How big is this overlap in the middle of the Venn diagram? There's only one way to find out. Talk. Talk to each other. Find out what do we want? What do we not want? Because, as, oh, should I stay or should I go? Well, you might as well, from the employer's perspective, say, well, should I keep or should I fire? So it's both sides of the coin, isn't it? We, we're looking at, at the big resignation or the big quit or the big migration as something the employees do. It's the employees market at the moment, no doubt about it. And that will, of course, have an impact on employers. What can they do to satisfy people enough to keep them in their business? And that is going to be a struggle for some businesses. Absolutely. So we have to be realistic in what can we ask for? Well, we can ask for everything, but can we realistically get everything we ask for? And I don't think so. And I don't think we, we ever should expect that. But it goes both ways. Employers can ask for a lot of things of their employees, and the employees can ask a lot of things of their employers. But if they don't talk together and, and figure out what works best for as many people in the organization, so the organization can do its business and people can live on the wages and the benefits and all the rest of it, then it's not going to work. And then people will just go from one place to the next. You know, Peter, talking with you reminded me of, you know, years back, I was in my early 20s and I worked for a corporation. And at the end of the day, at 3 p.m., they came out and and they actually resigned. Uh, 75 people were told that they were that they were going to be leaving and would not be returning. I have to tell you, about a hundred of us left following mm. them. That's following that's that's the absolute brilliant question to ask because don't worry as a as a business owner, don't worry about the people you've fired. They're gone. You have to worry about those who are left behind. And the demoralizing effect of seeing 75 people just out the door is tremendous. So everybody will wonder, okay, when it is my turn? And I better get in there before the boss does. So yes, of course, people will leave. And we, we have a recent example of, of a company where, where the chief exec fired 900 people via Zoom call. I can't remember the name of the company, but I think it, it, was, it was something, I, I can't remember the name, it doesn't matter. But well, if, if you do that, you have to worry about those who are left behind. What are they going to think? So before you even get to that point, this is them and us situation. I mean, regardless of the size of the company, you can, you can do the employee engagement. You can start talking to each other, either at a company-wide level or department by department, and then company-wide. It, it all depends on the size and shape and, and what the business does. Just get that dialogue going and then see what comes out of it. But there's, there's just one big word in there that nobody mentions. It's not a very big word. It's called trust. Tools are going to just pop up everywhere. Um, trust doesn't fix everything. We, we, I, I'm never of the opinion that we will just be one big, happy, clappy family in a business. No way, because businesses only exist because there are people in them. And we are as weird and wonderful in the business as we are outside of it. So we should always expect some diversity, some a bit of conflict sometimes, different opinions. But we should be allowed to have those different opinions. We should be allowed to say what works for me, what doesn't work for me. And, and in terms of the Venn diagram, what, what can we do? Well, I, I keep saying, well, ask, talk, because any organization will typically have somewhere between three and five generations in the organization. So obviously they want different things. Some have just started a family, some are close to retirement. Um, you know, some need to take the kids to school. It, it, there's all sorts of different things going on in our lives, which means don't go for the generic benefit package. Find something that actually suits the people that are there. Otherwise they won't use it. That, that so, is you, so, so true. You know, I, I know we, we, we spoke a lot about employees, but, and you having uh, been in that position as a CEO, and I've often heard you say how lonely and how cold 
it is at the top. Yeah, it can I mean, be. Like somewhat about those at the top as well, Peter, because like you always say, you have to have you have to have a healthy leadership in order to then have a healthy mm -hmm. the healthy organization. So it starts at the top. Could you reflect some, on that? Some, some, something happens when when we when we go in into business. We 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 take on the role of employee or we take on the role of CEO or manager or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden that, that becomes like a shield, a new front. And then we, we take on this persona that's this very business-like, very to the point, cold, numbers, numbers, and never mind, uh, never mind the human side. And well, we all have, play different roles in life, mom, dad, sister, brother, whatever, uncle, um, or employee, or boss, or CEO, or business owner. But we always have to remember that we're still us inside. So you can only ever consistently do who you are. So when we put on this role that we are not trying to play a different role, it can become quite contrived and we start to behave in ways that are unhelpful. And that goes for both sides of, 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 of the organization, the, the bosses and, and the non-managerial staff. So when you're at the top, people are looking at you now, mm, he's in charge or she is in charge. Um, and therefore we can just dump anything on them because they're in charge, <laughs> forgetting that they're a human being. Now, when you are at the top, you also want to be seen as this in command, in control person, forgetting your own human side, mm -hmm. forgetting that the people you are in control or in command of are also human beings, not just some bland uniforms sitting there. Um, they are human beings. And when you forget all of this, we start to do the wrong behaviors and, and have the wrong attitudes. And then it all comes down to the spreadsheet and the stock options and and whatever else. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look about look at a remote, the remote positions now, mm -hmm. and uh, what about um, employees who are now you know at home, and then you got it the, the employers. You know, what do you think in that role? Do you feel that uh, employers should give should should uh, instill more trust there, or do you feel that the employees it should be balanced? where employees are also showing that they are also being reli you know, reliable themselves. Well, you think about the remote. Trust works both ways, but you have to give before you can get. So you have to show the trust before you can, you can get it. You can't demand trust, it's something you, you, you earn. And if you have employees who couldn't care less, they, they, will, they will soon reveal themselves and you can deal with that then. But also when, when you show people the trust that, you, you know, okay, this is what we have to do by then, and they just deliver, whether they're in the office or, or back home, doesn't matter, they just deliver, then the nine to five just has no importance anymore in, in, in that respect. It does still have importance in, in other ways, but you have to go with the trust. You have to say, okay, you work from home, you know what you have to do, and I trust that you'll do it. So the management style, the leadership style has to be totally different when you work with remote workers. You have to check in very often, probably more often than you would in the office, but not so much that it becomes micromanagement. But it, it's, it's a different communication style. It, it's different objective setting rather than, oh, he's at work now, he's at his desk or she's at her desk, so I assume work gets done. Well, <laughs> You can't always guarantee that just because someone is glued to the screen that actually this one is doing anything. Um, they might just have been totally phased out doing presenteeism. Yes, I'm here, but the wheels ain't turning. But you know, it's there are. I, I just read a few statistics uh, about the U.S. recently, so I'm just looking down to see at, at those notes. Um, about forty-five percent of of of. Uh, of workers in the in the US work remotely, apparently, according to a study. And of those, 25% of them are doing it permanently. Mm -hmm. So with those numbers, you can imagine it's far easier to go back to where we started to change jobs because all you have to do is flick to another window and and be online and put in your CV. You don't have to hide anything in the office. You can just, well, okay, I work remotely. These guys want me to work remotely. Happy days, I can just stay where I am and, uh, and keep on going. So it's easier to, to, to leave. So I would say that employers would have to develop their employees to the point where they want to leave 
yes, and then uh, and then and then treat them in a way that they don't want to. And I know that um, you uh, could actually assist businesses with with this type of interaction. What, what would you suggest yeah. would be a really good something great that I'll be talking about at the end? But I just like to hear from you in terms of how we can bring more of a togetherness between in employers and their direct reports, the relationship within that within the company. Could you give me maybe an example of a way that you could possibly assist yeah. you know, businesses in this area? It's, it's about mindset. At the end of the day, it's about mindset. So we've been so used to the, to the short game, the quick, quick wins recently. So back in the day when, when I was a supply chain consultant, we were only getting some interest if we could estimate an ROI of one year. Mm -hmm. or less sometimes two years sometimes acceptable but in, in not nothing longer than that we wanted wanted now wanted yesterday he's going to be quick wins we have to change the mindset because all, all the numbers all, all the practical stuff still very very important i'm not not saying it isn't but as far as the people and the internal workings of the organization is concerned we have to think long term and strategically that means changing the mindset or reinforcing an existing mindset at the top, which says people are important. What does that mean? What am I going to let go of? What am I going to start doing? How will I get my, my senior leadership team on board? How will we then get our lower managers on board? How are we then going to get everybody else on board? Because it's all well and good if the CEO wants it, but that's it. I want it. But if you don't live it, if you don't enforce it, if you don't bring it out, then it won't work. And this is where I come in. I work with the CEOs, but I don't take over running the business. <laughs> I've got enough running my own business. I don't take over anybody else's business. I don't run anybody's business and tell them what to do. But we do talk about what would be practical, what would be good for their business, because every business is different. But they have the same material. It's called people. And people are weird and wonderful and come in all shapes and sizes and, and opinions and, and what have you. And you can't, you can't satisfy everybody. You can't be all things to all people. But you can make an effort to be the best you can for as many as possible. And then, you know, some will fall in line and, and like it. Others will not. And then you can help them find somewhere else where they would like to be. Because if you're not happy where you are, well, go somewhere else. And that's what that is what people are doing. They're just doing it to a greater extent now because whereas before we, we, we talked about, oh, let's, let's, let's get away from child labor. Let's not work all hours of the day. Let's look at health and safety, like physical health and safety. So that wasn't the focus. These days, it's the mental health and, and general well-being that's in focus, which is why a lot of companies are, are on the back foot because they never thought about it before. Not necessarily because they are nasty people, but simply because it wasn't the focus. And now the focus is there. And then you say, oh, my God, how do you deal with this one? That's where I come in. <laughs> to, to, to help deal with this one and demystify the whole thing. Because we can do an awful lot that doesn't cost anything. But it does require a mindset that trusts people, that wants other people to be able to do the same as you do. That's so that you, know. you can so you can phase yourself out sometimes, maybe a holiday, maybe retirement, maybe something else. The exit strategy, as, as I know you, you like to talk about a lot. What, what do you do when you don't? Well, you have to prepare the ground for not doing. Um, and so many people don't do that. So they are glued to the phone and their laptop when they are by the poolside with the family and everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Bosses, chief execs, they are very much alone at the top, but they need to, to show their human side. It is not a sign of weakness, on the contrary. Uh, you remember a discussion you now uh, had pre uh, previously about, I like what you said about the employee engagement, but you, uh, you also said that you don't just bring up different engaging type of activities without, like you were saying, taking care of the foundation first, because that's what a lot of companies are doing mm -hmm. right now. Could you re reflect on that? I see that. Yeah, yeah it's it is it, no no, no there's no point in, in having a pool table or a ball pit or free beer or whatever those those fun um, benefits are if people hate working in your company. You you for for those those benefits to be appreciated, 
you have to feel appreciated as a person first. Otherwise, it's just a tick box exercise. So that, there's an awful lot of work to be done first before we go into the trap, what I call shiny box syndrome, where you just buy a ready-made package and put in, and it looks great, and you can tick all the boxes. And then a few months later, actually, typically four months later, a lot of employee uh, benefit schemes fail because no one is interested in them. The whole thing was just made a huge deal instead of being a deal, a way of life. This is how we work here. So there's a lot of work, a lot of thinking to be done first about values, how to live the values, what are they, how do we enforce them, how do, do we make sure that, that we don't just say the words but don't walk the talk as well. And, and I'm going to be a bit controversial here and say this is not something you, you can leave, leave up to HR. This is a senior level, this is CEO level concerns that the CEO has to deal with and want. Then he or she can bring in HR as part of the whole team, doing it, living it, um, making sure it happens. But it's not something you can say one day, yeah, I want this, let's just give it to HR and sort out and then forget about the rest. No, it has to be a boardroom agenda item. It has engagement. How do we feel in the business? What is the employee experience? What is the management experience? What is it like working here? And you can find out what that is by regularly surveying your, your employees. And when I say employees, I, I mean everybody. Um, some people think an employee is just someone in a non-managerial role. No, managers, leaders are also employees. They work for the company, they get a paycheck, therefore they're employees. So everyone needs to have their input, but then you need to do something with the input. This one, you, Cause you mentioned something that uh, a lot of businesses are, are truly facing right now. And that is high levels of absenteeism and, yes. and high costs of recruitment. Could you reflect on, on those two areas? You know, well, today? absenteeism is sometimes planned, sometimes not planned. So it's, we're talking about the unscheduled absenteeism. So not when you book a doctor's appointment, not when you book your holiday. It's when you're off sick. Um, and a long time ago, um, stress actually went to the, to the number one spot of, of reasons why people go off sick. It used to be musculoskeletal reasons like bad back pain or, or something like that, but now it's stress. And, and people will call in sick with migraine, uh, tummy upset, um, mm -hmm. any, any old excuse instead of saying, look, I'm stressed, I'm burnt out, I'm, I'm feeling yeah. low. Because we're not allowed to talk about this part of the body, which is where the brain sits, which is also a very sensitive organ, just like the rest of what's inside us. So we have to be strong all the time. But actually, mm -hmm. we're not, we're human beings. And it's still a, a lot of stigma attached to saying, oh, I have a bad day. But anyway, when too many people are, are ill too often, you have to find out why. Is it seasonal? Is it because there, there's a big sporting event going on? Or is it one particular manager in one particular department whose staff are always off sick? Mm -hmm. You have to find out, go with the data and then find out, well, actually are people off sick because of what we do in the business? Do they get ill from working here? If that's the case, we can fix it if you want to. Or are they bringing in their trials and tribulations from, from everyday life into the business and actually just need an arm around the shoulder for, for five minutes and a cup of tea, and then they'll be fine again. So we have to look at people as people. And the more we do that, the longer they stay. We keep the talent. And then we don't have to recruit all the time. Recruitment is expensive, whether you use an agency or not. It's disruptive. There's training to be had and done. There's handovers. You have clients sitting there not knowing who is dealing with me or not. So. Recruitment is another part of, of, of what I talk to, to CEOs about as part of their strategy of building a better business in my Healthy Minds for Business program. Because a lot of recruitment is just replacement. Oh dear, I've got one month or one week or whatever to replace this bomb on this seat. So better get going and you go and grab someone if you can. But instead, if you think longer term, can I develop the people I have? What, what people do I... Am I likely to need at what point in the future? So let's go and, mm -hmm. and look for them already and have a plan for them. In that way, 
recruitment is still expensive, but if you have a plan, it's not wasted money. It's part of your strategy. Mm -hmm. I don't know that's so much easier said than done because you can't control all the moving parts outside the organization, but you certainly can control everything within it. <laughs>